Welcome to Business Day, Mr. No. Thank you, very thank much you so much for, for having us. me. Thank you very much. So let me start by asking what inspired you to start your NGO focusing on humanitarian activities and charity initiatives? What really happened was in the year 2002, I lost my older sister in a car accident. And after her burial in Kaduna, and I said to myself, so is this it? Today you're here, tomorrow you're not here, and life continues. So what is life all about? That we're always going up and down, trying to make things out of life. Well, at the end of the day, you're just going to die and be buried. So uh, you like it or not, when you're gone, you won't be talked about negatively or positively. So when my sister died, they buried her, and I knew how successful she was and what she was doing. And I said to myself, so you mean everything is all gone like that? And it got me thinking. Then I traveled out of the country. I was away for a year. So on my way back to Nigeria, I got into a taxi that was taking me to the airport in the UK. And by the time we got to the airport, my taxi fare was about 97 pounds. And the cab driver said to me that that was my lucky day free of charge. And I was puzzled and I asked him, uh, why are you taking me for free of charge? He said, uh, because that day happens to be the last day he's going to be a taxi driver. And he promised himself that whoever is going to go through that route, that's the way to his house, he's going to pick the person up for free. That was, wow. in and, yeah, that was in 2003 on my way back to Nigeria. Yeah, just, just after a year, I lost my sister. And I asked him, I said, so what are you going to do with your time? You look pretty strong. He said, oh, that he wants to go work for Red Cross in Iraq. I said, work for Red Cross in Iraq. Are you going to make more money there than being a cab driver? And he said something to me that really, really got to me. He said to me, life has gone beyond money. Life is what you can give to other life. That will make life, life and life important. Then I said to myself, okay, no problem. Me too, when I get to the age of 50, I will dedicate my life to humanity. But something struck me. I said to myself, why am I saying that when I get to the age of 50, me that just buried my sister a year ago, who was up to 35? So it means the time waits for no one. If you have the time to do it, do it. Then when I came back to Nigeria, I went to the drawing board with my people. I got people involved trying to see how we could do something to make a change. And I remember those days, my dad used to be in the government. My dad would tell me, say, listen, because I used to be very stubborn when I was growing up. My dad would say, listen, if you can't take my name to the different height, don't spoil my name for me. So we always laughed about it. Okay, you know what? Let's try and do something. But you see, when it comes to NGO in Nigeria, a lot of people are very skeptical because they think a lot of people want to get in there just to enrich themselves to make money. Then we came out with strategy various strategies where we will make our donors comfortable. Then we started with a project called Project Food for One Million. We said, okay, good. Mm. Let's try and have what you call the food drive. If people can go to church on Sundays and Monday, and most on Fridays, then why don't you touch a life once a month? Just show love to someone close to you. Then we started a food drive, quality food for one million, where we ask Nigerians to donate food items from food, toiletries, beverages, but no, no cash donation. That was a catch, no cash donation. Only food items that will be distributed to the, all the orphanages and widows and some communities that don't have the basic need. That's how we started the foundation called the Global Initiative for Peace, Love and Care. We call it GIPLC. Yes. So when we first started, a lot of people never believed in us. A lot of people never believed in us that we can really achieve what we want to achieve. They never believed in what we're doing. but. The zeal was there and the mind was there and we said we must achieve it no matter what because if you can think it, you can do it. That's how we started. We started giving support to all the orphanages on a monthly basis. That was in 2000 and 2003. Then as work goes on, then we started having cases of medical cases of children that their parents can't pay medical bills. Then we launched another project again called Save a Child. Save a Child is the one that has to do with healthcare. Mm -hmm. Then we started raising money for children that their parents can't pay medical bills within and outside Nigeria. And we launched another project called Educate a Child, where we support vulnerable children who are very good in school, but their parents can't afford to pay school fees. And then we have three projects going on. Food for One Million, taking care of orphanage with food items, save a child, raising money for sick children, and 
educate a child for education. And although today in the healthcare, we have raised over five to six million dollars for children all over Nigeria, including South Sudan. And in the education, we're exporting over 4,000 orphans in various schools. And on the monthly basis, again, we still support the orphanages with various things like basic needs from beverages, toiletries, food, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we've been on for the past 18 years. And our own work, we're like the police. You know, police have no holidays. They work two, four, seven. That's how, because when you're dealing with cases of sick children, today, right now, we have about 17 children in virus hospital within Abuja. And we still have about 500 children on our waiting list. So it's an everyday thing, everyday problem. It's a pandemic. Wow, wow, interesting. So how do you, I mean, you've already talked about the initiatives, some of the initiatives you do, which I was going yeah. to ask you. So I think I'll just have to move to the next question now. How do you, I mean, prioritize some of the communities that need assistance? How do you find the communities that need assistance and how do you prioritize some of these communities? Okay, you see, uh, because we've been on for the past 18 years, so most times people always reach out to us, either from uh, NTA, AI, or the TV station. They know what we do. And most times, most of the children that will raise money for always come from recommendation, either from the TV station, radio station. They will call us and say, listen, we know this is what you guys do, but we have a sick child that has a hole in the heart or has cancer of the eye or two more. So what can you guys do? Then most times, there are some that we need to select the urgent ones. We need to select the urgent ones because there are those that probably might have seven to two hours to leave. There are those that probably don't even have less than a week to leave. Then we'll start raising funds for those ones. And when it comes to the community, most times we we'll always go for what you call need assessment. You visit the communities, you know what they lack, what they need. It's not all communities that they need support. There are some they need more support than the others. Then we'll select those ones that they are most in need, then you start tackling them from there. Okay, so what are some of the biggest challenges that you face doing this work? Wow. Insincerity of people. Because most times, parents of sick children, they seem to look at the child like the goose laying the golden egg. Some of them, they will reject for them to get support. Why? Because when they beg with the kids on the street, they make more money than the child being cured. There was a lady a couple of years ago, her child had two more of the eye. The eye popped out. She was begging on the street. We saw her, we picked her up, took her to the hospital. The child was admitted. The child was supposed to start going for chemotherapy. One day she took the child out of the hospital. She said she doesn't want again. Because why? She made almost about 30 to 40,000 naira every day on the street begging. And she left. And our healthcare system, again, is so lay back because I see no reason why the hospital will allow a mother to take her child out of the hospital because that child belongs to the government as long as the child is not up to 18 to make the teacher for him or herself. So as long as the child is under 18, the government and the hospital have the power to say to tell the woman, listen, you can't take this child away because you are going to temper the life of the child, like in the UK or the US. Your child is your child, but if the doctor sees that the child might not make it and you want to take a decision contrary to that, they will stop you. They'll even call the authorities on you, social welfare. But it doesn't happen that way in Nigeria. All they'll just do, they'll tell you, okay, you write on undertaking that whatever happens to your child is your business. Can you believe that? Well, that's actually very ridiculous. I mean, and it brings me to another question where I'm going to ask, how do you ensure that there's transparency and accountability in your operations? Okay, you know, when we first started, we were skeptical giving the parents money for treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every day you learn. So when we first started, we would pay checks or transfer direct to the hospitals that are doing the treatment. But you see, when you're dealing with private hospitals, if they tell you that they need two million, you can pay them exact money, two million, everything will be done. But you see, when you come to government hospital, 80% of what will be used for either the surgery or treatment has to be bought outside. They don't have it there. The, all they have in the hospital is probably cutting wood, syringe, finish. Other things, even surgeries, we need to go buy stuff outside for the surgery. So we found that when money goes into the account of the hospital, it hardly comes out. Because imagine, hospital will give you a bill, or you need a bill for a child that has two more, 1.5 million. 
and you pay the money 1.5 million, the day of the surgery, they will tell you, oh, we don't have item one to seven, go buy it outside. And guess what? You've already given them money for the whole items and you can't get them a refund to go get it outside. It means you have to take a longer process. You have to write letters, your management of your hospital have to meet. So it's a long procedure bureaucracy. So what we do now is pay as you go with government hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's pay as you go. As I speak to you right now, we have a child going for chemo. 90% of the material being bought for the chemo is being bought outside. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I even like it that way because we are in charge of the funds. We're not giving it to the parent, we're not giving it to the hospital. So we we'll always have receipts, we we'll all have a breakdown where everything is being checked. Receipts, invoice, payment, dischargement, and the rest. Because there was a time we gave a lady $3 million for a sick child. She refused to pay till the child died. Wow. So by we paying directly, we're getting all the receipts. We're dealing directly with the hospital. I mean, the room for any misappropriation has been blocked. I get that. When we collaborate with hospitals, then it just gives you direct access. But I still want to know how you get to collaborate with other organizations and government to maximize your impact. Do you do this and how? Yeah, like, uh, you know, we're in Abuja. We have cases from in various states in Nigeria, from the east, from the south, from the west. So we have other NGOs in other states that we trust very well, that we work together, that if we can't be there, they are there. They happen to be our eyes there. And whatever situation we find ourselves, we send funds to them, they pay for the treatment, they pay for the surgeries, and they send back receipts and a report of how it's been done. And you see, the tricky part of it, again, sometimes by the time you pay for a sick child's treatment and you think it's done, it is not done. When the child is coming for a checkup in two, three weeks, they will call you again, oh, we don't have transport to come, or they've given a prescription for drugs. And it's not like an investment you can't pull out. You can't pull out. You must follow it to the latter. You can't pull out. So sometimes people always believe, oh, okay, oh, we've donated two million for the sick child surgery. It doesn't end there. They have aftercare. People always come. They check what's going on. I mean, like today now we have a child that came in from Joss that have been discharged about three weeks ago, but they came in today as a big surgery again that I have to go in today. So that's why I keep saying that it is like an everyday problem. I mean, the pandemic every day. It's not like other NGOs that you sit down and you think you're good. We've done a project today and nothing's mm -hmm. going to happen again until after two, three weeks. No, it doesn't happen every minute of the day. Wow. That's actually a lot of work that you get to do. So I'm sure that in line of your work, every day is fulfilled and every day that you get to save a child's life, every day you get to take care of a child's health, it's fulfilling. And I know that you focus majorly on kids. Am I right? Majorly on children. Yeah, that children, correct? yeah. Okay, right. Can you share yeah, with us a particularly impactful or memorable moment in the line of your work, a particularly memorable moment doing this work that you've had? I'll even give you two. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, in 2013, we had a baby that was born without a skull. The first child ever born in this world, no skull. They were living in Ibadan, and the landlady evicted them and called the baby an evil child. So we brought them to Abuja here. We kept them for about two, three months. We were looking for a way out. So we wrote to hospitals in London, in the US, Dubai, Germany, France, and they all replied us that the baby's condition has never existed before. There is no precedent. It has never existed. Only one doctor in the US, Dr. Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson wrote to us that, uh, that her surgery had never been done before. He has retired from medical, but he's going to come back to the theater because of that child. And they're going to reconstruct a new skull for her, a surgery that has never been done for a fee of $234,000. And it took us 24 hours to raise that money. No, not, gov not government, individual, good Nigerian, good hearted Nigerian. We raised the money within 24 hours. We flew the child to the U.S. We reconstructed a new skull for her. And when they opened the child, they found out that the brain wasn't growing normally like other kids because of so much fluid. So after the surgery, they put the girl on some kind of like special wheelchair because she can't walk very well. She has to be controlling with her hand. But that was in 2013. And 
she lived for six years before she passed on. And, wow. uh, and they give them a green card. The family lives in the U.S. now. Wow. Then we have another boy again. The boy's name is Ali Amadou Chibok. Ali, the night of the kidnap of the girls in Chibok, in Boko Haram, in 2014, April 14th, Ali was just two years old. So when Ali came out running, one of the Boko Haram guys ran over Ali with a motorcycle over his back. And Ali was just about barely three years old, just two and a half years. And Ali was left for dead for three and a half years. Ali couldn't walk. All the bones behind his back were broken. So we brought Ali to Abuja. We took him to all the hospitals. And they told us that we should forget that Ali will never, ever walk again. But you see, I don't always believe in things like that because man is man, God is God. So we wrote to all the hospitals that we have been dealing with in the US, in the UK, Dubai. And Dubai wrote to all that, that there's a 50 50 chance that Ali might work again. And they gave us a bill of $48,000. And we we're able to raise the money within friends, good Nigerians, and we flew Ali to Dubai. By the time we went to Dubai with Ali, we arrived in Dubai. The next day, Ali was wheeled into the theater. It took them about maybe eight to nine hours surgery. And they told us that maybe Ali will work after maybe seven to eight weeks. But after seven days, Ali was on his feet, walking. All the TV stations in Dubai were all rushing to the hospital because Ali's story became like a phenomenon because of the Boko Haram story. So everybody came, nobody could believe Ali was working again. Even the wife of the Emir of Sharjah, Sharjah is a city in Dubai, sent flowers present to Ali. So Ali was like a celebrity in, in Dubai. Then Ali started working. We stayed with Ali for Dubai for about three to four months so that Ali could recover very well. But Ali, a lesson teacher, because then Ali was almost blank. Ali, at five years old, Ali doesn't even know what the word color, red, black is. Wow. So we started rehabilitating Ali, and we came back to Nigeria. And today, Ali is 11. Ali lives with us. He's in school now. This is such, I mean, heartwarming stories. And it's just beautiful work that you're doing with your organization. And I must say, well done to you. I can imagine how you just feel being able to be the channel that a child gets a second chance to life. Chance to life, yeah. It's very impressive. Well done. So I'm That's going to right. ask you now, I mean, you mentioned how at one point, these two examples that you've given, this most memorable yeah. event, you mentioned how you were able to raise the money in 24 hours. I don't know precisely yeah. how much. And then you also $234,000. $234,000. Yeah. Wow. So now I'm going to ask you this question. How can individuals or even groups of people get to support the work that GIPLC is doing? Uh, you feel like I keep telling people every day, I say, listen, sometimes it's not about the money. Because there's some kind of help that is not all about finance, some kind of like mentoring. Because sometimes we have children mm -hmm. that we trying to rehabilitate. Either they're trying to derail, we'll bring them on board, we'll coach them, put them in schools. Sometimes, again, we have kids like the girl child education, like we're focusing more on girls to go to school now to see how we can support. But you see, like I keep telling people, I said, listen, everybody can support. You don't have to be Bill Gates or Dan Gote to support the little you can. And we, you know, we use the power of volume to raise money. We don't believe one person can give you 10 million, 5 million that you need. If today we're looking for 1 million naira now, we'll look for 10 people to give you 100,000 naira, or 1,000 people to give you 1,000 naira each, or 100 people to give you 10,000 naira each. So every donor must have a category where he or she belongs. So we're all on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. And we'll tell people, say, listen, you know, you're part of Touching Life every day. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and see what we're doing. And every day you must see what we're posting because we we'll post every day. You must see cases that we're doing. You must see cases. Now, right now, there's a case that they brought to us today. Some boy is five years old. He was shot by the bandit in Kaduna State. So right now, he was shot. He needs to put some metals. And you know that more than need two million dollars. We're going to start the campaign now. Anybody that wants to be part of GIP or the Touching Life Every Day campaign, I mean, the only way is either you Google us or you go to our website or you go to our Instagram and social media pages because I'm even happy with the existence of social media because without social media, 
probably today we wouldn't have achieved what we have achieved in the last 18 years. Because those days when we first started in the year 2005, 2006, social media wasn't really big. We used to just write letters, meet people, offices. But now you just sit down in your house, you don't even need to write to anyone. People that want to support come online to see what you're doing and they support. I mean, what you're letting us know now is the impact of social media on sustainable yeah. philanthropy. And I think yeah. that's interesting. Brilliant. So what are the future plans and some of your goals for expanding the reach of this NGO? Our future plan now is what we're trying to do. We're trying to see how the government can introduce new policies that can support the most vulnerable ones, especially children, in terms of healthcare. If the government can even declare a state of emergency in the healthcare system, because I'll be sincere with you, it, it is not good. It is not good. We're just living by the grace. Because whatever happens to anyone today in Nigeria, if you are well to do, your family will fly you out. But when you are not, then you find that, yeah, you, I mean, you're just left for either you die or you just carry your cross on your own. So the future, what we plan to do now is trying to see how government can introduce new policies that will enable, that will create room for corporate Nigeria to increase more of their CSR because the economy of today and the economy of 10 years ago wasn't the same. So things are getting tougher every day. So we need to have people more to come on board to do more CSR. To do more CSR, to see how we can reach those in need. Because the numbers keep increasing every day. The number of people today in need increases every day. And I'll be sincere with you. We have more children in need than children who need to fly out. Last year, this same time, we flew up maybe about 25 children to India for various surgeries. Dollar was 750 to 1. But today, dollar is expensive. We come, I mean, to buy dollar now, almost about ten thousand dollars, about twelve million naira now, and it's very difficult to get donors to donate like they used to donate before. Economy is getting bad. So the way economy is shrinking, but we believe corporate Nigeria individuals, like I said to you, using the power of volume, there's nothing that is too much that we cannot raise. Today, now, if you have a million Nigerians to give you a thousand naira, you just one billion naira. Last year, this time. We did a charity event in Paris, a friend of mine who was celebrating his birthday in collaboration with my NGO that was celebrating our 17th year anniversary. And we were able to raise about $120,000. And I'll be sincere with you, the day we came back to Nigeria, July last year, we gave out 100 million naira in one day, it finished. One day in just two hours, we exhausted 100 million naira. Wow. So there's no amount of money today you think you, we will have that you think, oh, it will take them one or two years. Impossible. A billionaire today cannot last three weeks to us. It's going to be exhausted. And people are still in need. Mm. Wow. This is quite interesting. And I do hope that the government will actually take some of this, Amen. Put in some so. of these policies so. that will, you know, impact this work that you're doing with the foundation. Really brilliant work. Well done, Mr. Noah. And thank you so much for giving us your time today. At and uh, one more thing. You see this GIPLC? GIPLC, okay. GIPLC saved my team and I some years ago. We were kidnapped by some Flanny boys in George Plateau State. And one of the Flanny boys happens to be wearing the same GIPLC t shirt. Apparently, he benefited from one of our outreach one year before that date. Wow. So he was our saving grace. Isn't that beautiful? That's such a beautiful story. Wow. That's how life is. I mean, you know, a lot of Nigerians believe that when God is going to bless you, God is going to bless you with finance, cash. But no, blessings come in various different ways. Being alive is a blessing. It's bigger than any amount of money. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much, Mr. Nuru, for sharing all of this with us. Yeah, thank today. you so much, yeah. I really appreciate your time. We truly appreciate your time. And I hope that now we're talking about 18 years, we're going to be talking about 20, 30, 40 years, and 50 years. And this foundation yeah, yeah. will even outlive you by the special grace Amen. of God. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you yeah. so much for your time, Mr. Nu. Thank you very much for joining us on the Business Day Sustainable Philanthropy Series. Looking forward to seeing you at the next episode. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Musa.